I want to talk about abrupt irreversible climate change today. Thanks to Nazreen and the entire panel for inviting me. These are a few of the outcomes that are evident so far with respect to abrupt irreversible climate change. I'm not going to go into any of them in details, just demonstrating the broad overview of where we're at so far. Even the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, one of the most conservative scientific and political bodies in the history of the planet, has concluded that we have initiated abrupt climate change. In fact, even abrupt geophysical events do not approach those of human-driven change. So what they're con they concluded on October 8th, 2018, that we are in the most abrupt geophysical event in planetary history, as nearly as we can tell. Furthermore, climate change is irreversible on timescales relevant to human societies and ecosystems, according to their September 24th, 2019 report, the IPCC special report on the ocean cryosphere and a change of climate. And this is no particular surprise because the predecessor to the IPCC, the Advisory Group on Greenhouse Gases, concluded a long time ago that beyond one degree C may elicit and then they have language that refers specifically to self-reinforcing feedback loops. In addition, David Spratt, climate writer and speaker, concluded in a presentation in October of 2014 that we actually triggered these self-reinforcing feedback loops at a half a degree C above the 1750 baseline. I've detailed some of these self-reinforcing feedback loops, most notably 68 of them at my climate change summary at guymcpherson.com. And then a few more in my latest peer-reviewed papers, one for academia letters and the latest in results in engineering, which is part of the esteemed Elsevier series of journals. In addition, according to famed professor Andrew Glickson at Australian National University, in his October 8th, 2020 book, The Event Horizon, we are, have already passed the 2C Rubicon. In addition, we have been in the midst of a mass extinction event for more than 30 years, as pointed out by the father of diversity, Edward O. Wilson, in his 1992 book, in which he's, it's quoted on page 32, humanity has initiated the sixth great extinction spasm, and so on. It's difficult for a lot of people to understand that we are in the midst of exponential change. So this figure demonstrates what exponential actually looks like. Everybody knows about playing with dominoes, but what you may not know is that a domino can knock over another domino, which is about one and a half times larger. So what I have here is a chain of dominoes. Each one is one and a half times larger than the previous one. The smallest domino is about five millimeters high and one millimeter thick. Now, we'll carefully place it. And there are 13 dominoes. The largest domino, it weighs about 100 pounds and is more than a meter tall. Ready? Boom. That was 13 dominoes. If I had 29 dominoes, the last domino would be as tall as the Empire State Building. So that's the short version of exponential change. We are in the midst of abrupt irreversible climate change, which is responsible for the ongoing mass extinction event. As reported by the United Nations Environment Program in October 2010, finally reported in a peer-reviewed paper on March 2nd, 2011, and reported subsequently in a few other peer-reviewed articles, including notably two lead authored by Herodor Ceballos, the latter of which refers to biological annihilation as signaled by vertebrate population losses and declines. And then finally, that we are in the midst of a mass extinction event was confirmed by 
This paper in Biological Reviews published January 10th, 2022, leaving no question for most of us that we are in the midst of a mass extinction event and that that, that event is driven, as most of them have been, by rapid changes in the climate of the planet. Finally, Dr. Henry G, senior editor at Nature, concluded in a paper in Scientific American, his final words, if we're going to start writing about human extinction, we better start writing now. And the reason for that is he foresees very, very rapid rate of ongoing change to continue, which will lead to human extinction in the very near future. And that's no surprise given that the IPCC, the rate of change projected by the IPCC in their previous assessment um, has vertebrates failing to adapt by a factor of 10,000 times. Mammals can't keep up either. And according to the peer reviewed literature, again, in the esteemed nature series, in scientific reports, tardigrades almost certainly will not survive. In fact, it appears that we're headed for the loss of all life on Earth, paper by Strona and Bradshaw, November 13th, 2018, in, again, the esteemed nature series, specifically in scientific reports, concludes that a rogue, seemingly desert Earth wandering across the universe could still have some tiny chance of blooming again under some lucky and unlikely circumstances. Those are the odds we have of retaining life on Earth given the ongoing rapid rate of environmental change. Stern and Bradshaw are, are biologists and ecologists, uh, and that makes them well-suited to address the issue of environmental change and its implications for the ability of species to survive. Where are we headed? So that tells where we are so far and where we're headed, according to a paper by Burke and colleagues in, published in Proceedings National Academy of Sciences, indicates that climates like those of the Pliocene will prevail as soon as 2030 and persist under climate stabilization scenarios. And they rely upon the representative concentration pathways of the IPCC to reach this conclusion. The RCPs do not include mention of aerosol masking, which I'll get to shortly, or self-reinforcing feedback loops. So to say that they are conservative would be a very conservative statement. With respect to marine systems, looking specifically at the world's ocean, Tresos et al. concluded that uh, abrupt exposure events begin before 2030. And sure enough, we don't have to look far to see that that's what's going on in the world's oceans. We're losing many species at a very rapid rate as a result of the rapid rate of environmental change. Perhaps the most pressing concern with respect to humans and our ability to adapt is what's called the wet bulb temperatures. And this paper from Science Advances indicates that we are already in the position of losing many people on the planet in tropical and subtropical regions as a result of exceeding wet bulb temperatures. Part of that is because that the 35 degrees Celsius wet bulb temperature that we have been using and assuming was the correct number is actually way too conservative. And the Journal of Applied Physiology, this paper in the Journal of Applied Physiology finds that the wet bulb temperatures occurred significantly lower than 35 degrees C. So it's no surprise then that we're losing habitat for human animals as well as for many other species around the planet. Just a short mention of aerosol masking, what's sometimes called global dimming. Before the sun's rays strike the planet and therefore are able to warm up the planet and have that warmth trapped by greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide, water vapor, methane, and so on. Before that can happen, the sun's rays, the energy must get through these aerosols, which are in the atmosphere. As little as a 35% reduction in 
those particles in the atmosphere will lead to a one degree C temperature rise. According to Professor James Hansen, the father of climate change, that change will happen in about five days. He, Hansen has mentioned this five day period for the aerosols to fall out of the atmosphere during several presentations and also during several interviews. So it would be a very rapid rate of change that would continue and in fact exacerbate the overheating of the planet. That early paper from 2013 was found to be too conservative, of course, as we've come to expect this from a paper in science. And more recently from the open access paper in Nature Communications, the loss of aerosol masking would cause a 55% increase in overall planetary he heating with 133% of that occurring over land, where obviously most of us live. So loss of aerosol masking is an extremely important component of climate change that is almost never mentioned by the corporate media and also by paid climate scientists. So that brings two questions to mind. What shall I do? And sh what shall we do? How shall we respond? This figure, I think, demonstrates quite clearly one approach. The approach of why am I here must be answered by each of us individually. For me, I am a teacher. This is who I am. This is not merely what I do. In fact, I haven't been paid for my teaching efforts for more than 13 years. But I continue to voluntarily go on speaking tours and also offer the Only Love Remains workshop created by my partner, Pauline, and I, in this case, shown in our home earlier this year. And we have offered the workshop twice this year. Now, according to, to Kurt Vonnegut, quoting his son, Mark, we are here to help each other through this, whatever this is. And I think that's a perfectly legitimate approach to dealing with the loss of habitat for human animals as well as for much of the remaining life on earth. Kurt Vonnegut also quotes his, his uncle, whose name I can't remember, in indicating a somewhat more lighthearted approach to the situation we're in. I think we can do both of these. I don't think these are mutually exclusive. I think these apply not only at the level of individuals, but also at the level of society. As Edward Abbey, the Southwestern writer, pointed out, if the situation is hopeless, there's nothing to worry about. And so I don't spend a lot of time worrying about things that are beyond my control. In terms of the things that are within my control, such, the such as the ability to get the message out about abrupt irreversible climate change, I'm completely on board. But I don't have much control over, say, wealthy people launching spaceships into space. And so I don't concern myself with those kinds of things over which I have no control. Edward Abbey also pointed out, action is the antidote to despair. And so I encourage action. I've already indicated the actions that I take in light of abrupt irreversible climate change. I don't think that because the situation is hopeless, that means we necessarily give up whatever that means with respect to our interactions with other people and our ability to make life better for ourselves and for other people. In fact, for many years, along with my partner, Pauline, I have suggested planetary hospice as a way forward. And here I'm quoting Stephen Jenkinson, the Canadian member of what he called the death trade for most of his adult life. And he, I believe correctly, points to hope as being a four-letter word for people who are unwilling to know things for what they are. He suggests we be hope-free and suggests instead that we pursue grief. And that makes perfect sense when you look at the definition of hope, to cherish a desire with anticipation, to want something to happen to, or, or be true. Just because I want something to be happen doesn't mean 
Just because I want something to happen doesn't mean it actually will happen. Again, this returns us to the Edward Abbey quote, action is the antidote to despair, and it actually might make a difference. So that's the approach I encourage. On a similar note, the Grief Recovery Institute suggests that grief is wishing for a different past. Hope is wishing for a certain future. Grief is wishing for a different past. I won't spend a lot of time working on this or speaking about this. With respect to planetary hospice, there are three levels I want to briefly describe. The personal level in which you treat everyone you come across as you treat your beloved dying grandmother. Do you lie to her? Of course not. Does she lie to you? Of course not. She's dying after all. People in hospice are routinely known for their willingness to tell the truth, even as, or perhaps particularly because they are dying. At the community level, we must address issues such as racism, misogyny, homelessness, and other community level challenges. Just because the situation is dire for us as a species does not mean we can't alleviate the pain experienced by some people because of their, the color of their skin, for example, or because of the DNA with which they were born. So there are many approaches we can take to address societal level and community level issues. Most notably at the societal level, we must immediately decommission nuclear power plants because the evidence indicates that release of ionizing radiation from those nuclear power plants, should they melt down in our wake or because we haven't paid attention, will cause severe tropical stratospheric ozone depletion, which will greatly accelerate planetary overheating. This was subtly demonstrated in the 2021 film Finch, starring Tom Hanks. And if you didn't know, about the loss of stratospheric ozone leading to very rapid heating, you wouldn't know what was going on in that film. But if you have that knowledge, you can understand the subtlety with which it was presented. So if you haven't seen that, and this is odd for me because I almost never watch movies, I would recommend watching this 2021 film, Finch. As Homer pointed out in the Iliad nearly 2,800 years ago, any moment might be our last. Everything is more beautiful because we are doomed. And in the previous paragraph, Homer referred to the gods and specifically why the gods envy us mortals. They envy us because any moment might be our last. And what that does is gives us inspiration to live in a certain way, to recognize that our time is short and therefore to smell the flowers to appreciate the beauty that is all around us. Because we will never be here again is a great opportunity and inspiration to appreciate what we have. The gods are not so lucky. They live forever. What's one more sniff of the flowers for them? Nothing. I want to leave with this on the screen and you can find this information at guymcpherson.com in the about section. It describes my advice for what it's worth, for everybody, for anybody. I recommend specifically living with, with intention and living urgently because after all, no matter how old we are, no matter what part of the world we live in, our life could be snatched away at any moment. Living with death in mind, I don't think has any disadvantages. So I would like to leave this on the screen for as long as I'm here, able to respond to questions, or maybe we move on now to Dr. Carter's presentation. So thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to continued interactions over the course of the next three hours or so.